Hello and welcome to the Walled Culture Podcast, where we take a look behind the copyright bricks blocking access to knowledge and innovation. I'm Carla Nullington, and our Walled Culture guest today is Walled Culture's very own Glenn Moody, the editor for the Walled Culture Project and the author of our new Walled Culture book, which is a free-to-download introduction to the whole broad topic of digital copyright, with fresh insights provided by our many expert guests in our podcast series. And Glenn's a journalist, a blogger, and himself an expert on digital copyright and its excesses. And I think, Glenn, we have to start by asking a bit, uh, can you tell listeners um, a bit about the project, how it came about and and its intent and why we're here at all doing this right now? Sure. Uh, in many ways, wall culture is a kind of follow-up to a previous project I was involved in, which was about a specific piece of European legislation, the European Union Copyright Directive, which I wrote about over a couple of years. And that turned out to be a disaster, both in terms of the legislation and personally, in the sense that we were trying to stop this going through in its worst form, but we failed. And we have actually one of the worst laws uh, of the copyright world, which is now being implemented. And so the World Culture Project is really a chance to look back over the last 30 years of digital copyright, because we've only really had copyright in the digital world for that time, asking how did it happen? And if you like, where did it all go wrong? <laughs> and that's a nice, succinct description. Um, and, and as part of that, of course, Glenn's making weekly um uh, blog posts that you can go back and look through. There's a whole archive there on waldculture.org um, covering all sorts of topics, some from the past, some on issues that are arising on the day sometimes that the blog post goes up because sadly copyright excesses never um, rest. There's always something new that seems to be arising. Um, and I, I, I thought maybe we'd start from um, the very beginning, really, because for many of us, we might see or encounter lots of things that we think of as as being problems on the internet without really understanding why they're happening and without realizing that they're actually the problems of copyright on the internet and in the online world, not so much some vague general problem. And it can be really hard for us to start to piece together this larger picture, which is, of course, part of the incentive of this overall project. And and, and in our discussion day, we hope uh, today we hope that you'll be will be connecting some of these dots for listeners, and of course the book does that for you too. But uh, really, the problems with copyright start because it was a regime designed for an analog world, and in some ways a very old analog world, and then there it hasn't really. Um, transitioned well to the digital world we live in now. And so could you tell us a bit about what was what was there before and um, what happened and, and kind of where are we? And we'll go into more details on some of the legislation, et cetera, later on, so you don't have to dive too deeply into that. But, but give us an opening picture. Well, I think that's, that's a good place to start because really this is the kind of underlying problem. It's something I've been trying to understand, you know, where it went wrong. And as you rightly say, copyright was designed for an analog world. It, modern copyright actually dates back to 1710, something called the Statute of Anne. And it was quite a clever idea at the time. It was designed to give you know money to artists and such like. And um, everybody thought, yeah, this is pretty good. Let's build on it. So the, the term of copyright, how long it actually uh, operated for, went up from 28 years to 56 years, and then more and more until finally we've arrived at life plus 70 years. And again, everyone seemed to think well, that's a good, great idea. You know, artists get rewarded. But what has happened along the way is we've moved from an analog world to a digital world. Now, what does that mean? So an analog world is basically a, a world of things. And you can't make copies of things very easily. If you think of a photocopier, that makes copies, but they're very bad copies. If you photocopy a photocopy and keep on doing that, you end up with a black blob. The digital world is very special. If you have a digital file and you make a copy of that digital file, it is identical to the original. 
If you copy it a million times, it's still identical. You can make an infinite number of copies of a digital file that will be perfect. And copyright is based on the assumption you can't do that. Copyright is based on the assumption that copying is very hard. When copying becomes trivially easy, as we now have in the internet world, copyright has problems because you're trying to make water unwet when you're trying to stop people from making copies of digital files. Digital files are essentially made to be copied. And if you've got copyright, which says you have to ask permission to make copies, and you've got the internet that says, I'm going to make copies of everything you put on me, clearly you've got a fundamental clash. And that clash is being worked through in a series of laws that are really rather bad because they're trying to retrofit either copyright to the internet or the internet to the copyright. And it's not working because they are fundamentally incompatible. And and as as we'll see, because I know we'll be going through some examples and some um, some of the problematical legislation, but a lot of what we've seen as well is the copyright holders, and that doesn't generally mean you or me or um, a, a, a musician or some bit a writer putting out an individual piece of work, but the big copyright um, industry organizations, what they've really also done is try to expand these rights, even beyond, co they use the copyright to, to control even more aspects of how we interact with technology and the internet. So I know we'll come to some of that because that's one and of the- fact, One other thing perhaps I could add, mm. you just reminded me is that um, the other big thing is that 100 years ago, 200 years ago, nobody cared about copyright unless you were an artist or a, a publisher. Nowadays, everything you and I do on the internet is covered by copyright, even though we don't care about copyright. So you can't do something on the internet without invoking copyright, which means all these laws, which, as you rightly say, have been brought in at the behest of big companies, apply to us. They apply to the photo that we make and send to our family. That's covered by copyright. And therefore, the laws that were designed for the corporate world are being applied to you and me. And again, you're getting a clash between what the laws were designed to do and how they actually interact in the real world. And you've got, I know, some great examples of copyright absurdities, too, where we can go into some of this um, later on. Um, one of the areas that I think uh, was a really early area um, affected by copyright in at the start of the internet, even before we had the web, but had a, 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 a command line based internet, this was already beginning to arise, was um, around publishing. And, and that's rolled forward over the years to where it's just expanded and expanded into our new ways of interacting with things that we read or that we want to publish ourselves. And um, maybe that might be a good place to start. Can you expand on some of the issues there and maybe offer some uh, some examples? Because this is a good historical beginning as well from that opening, um, those opening remarks. So um, there are various aspects. Uh, for example, one of the things that people probably don't think about is uh, the visually impaired uh, reading materials. And uh, nowadays we have the technology to convert books into materials that the visually impaired can read very easily. And what's remarkable is how the copyright industries, particularly the publishers, have fought back against that. So what you might think is a matter of social justice in terms of allowing people who struggle to read materials is actually turned into a battle over copyright. And there's something called the Marrakesh Treaty, which was uh, finally signed in 2013. And this is after decades of argument. Um, basically, the publishers saying we couldn't allow the visually impaired simply to take materials already existing, so electronic files of books, and convert them into materials suitable for them to use, because that would weaken copyright in some way. So what was originally just trying to make it possible for people who had difficulties reading, turned into this huge battle about the sanctity of copyright. So that, I think, is a good example of where copyright suddenly turned into this obstacle to people who had problems. Mm. Um, how about the um, some of the I also the some of the Project Gutenberg to Google I'd and um, there's and some of the um, 
ways in which copyright has affect online copyright has affected the way we think about online libraries that is different from the analog world again a, a way in which analog copyright just does not um even when you're arguing we want to apply it the same way it's it's the 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 people who want to do things that are more analog are told that you can't use it in an analog way but you also can't use it in a digital way. So it's it's this crazy mix. But give us some of the history sure. there. That So uh, this is sort of similar to that uh, issue about the visually impaired. In the same way, it is very easy to create materials for them, but the copyright industry says no. It is also now trivially easy to take a digital file of a book and essentially turn it into a huge index of that book. And indeed, every book you could create the, an index of every book ever written. And indeed, uh, various projects have started to do that, most famously the Google Books project. But instead of embracing this as a fantastic way to expand reading, to actually embrace literature, again, the publishing industry said no. They said, no, this is an infringement of copyright. We're not going to do this. Even though there's a tremendous opportunity opened up by the digital world, as you rightly say, they said, no, you know, Books are things that you, you buy or you read in a library one person at a time. You can't do all this fancy digital stuff. And in fact, the, the, there was a court case uh, over the Google Books that went on for a decade or so. And it resulted ultimately in the Google Books project stalling. So Google wanted to scan essentially every book that there was and then put that online and let people access it. It also wanted to pay authors in terms of selling ebooks. Um, but the publishers effectively kill that idea. And now there's just this kind of ghost of a, a project that exists. And this has carried over also for libraries, you mentioned. Um, again, the potential is, is huge that libraries would be able to take digital copies of books and to, to share them in all sorts of ways. But what the publishers realized is that they actually have more control over a digital book than they do a physical book. When you sell a physical book, they lose control of it. When they have a digital book, they retain control of it. They can actually take that book away from you. And so we are moving to a world where libraries and indeed ordinary users no longer own books. They simply rent them. So you buy a license to read the book, not to own it. So the whole concept of ownership is actually being eroded thanks to copyright. And one of the, I think, I always think one of the most um, sadly amusing and ironic examples of that that people might actually remember was was Amazon deciding to go into your, um, if you had a Kindle to, um, and you had a, a copy of 1984 that you'd bought from Amazon, they actually went in and withdrew it from your Kindle and it vanished. I mean, of, of all the books. There's nothing do about it. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. That was probably the worst PR move um, ever in terms of highlighting uh, um, the problem you didn't want to highlight, but um, of all the books to do. Um, and that is a warning that they could do that to any book. I mean, it's it's not unique to 1984. They still retain control over books you thought you'd bought. And and libraries. What? Why is an online library not like an analog library when it comes to borrowing a book? Well, I think you have to ask publishers. I think it's more that publishers have realized that the way copyright law has been structured uh, gives them a, a special power over libraries. And that's really uh, because of something called uh, DRM, Digital Rights Management. So because, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's very easy to make copies of digital files, Publishers and indeed everyone else in the copyright industry has worked very hard to stop that happening. And they do that by imposing locks on those files to stop you copying them. Now, what's amusing in a sad sort of way is that those locks are very weak. They're very easy to break. There is no DRM that has not been broken. So at the end of the 1990s, uh, the US and the EU both passed laws saying that it doesn't matter if you can break the lock. If you break the lock, you're breaking the law. It doesn't matter how weak the protection, the protection is protected. And what that means is that when a library buys an ebook, that ebook is protected by this DRM, and therefore they can't do certain things with it because DRM forbids it. And they're not allowed to circumvent DRM because that would be against the law. So that gives the publishers tremendous power over libraries and indeed individual users because 
you can't do anything if you disagree. They just say, well, you, there's nothing you can do. The law says you can't do anything. And the crazy thing was that at the precise moment when it might have seemed most obvious that we were living in an online world in which there should be a different relationship with the usage of books, especially at a time of crisis. I mean, we've just gone through a pandemic where suddenly everyone was stuck at home, including school children. Um, and we, there's a good example. Maybe you can tell us a bit about what the Internet Archive tried to do and now That's is stuck right. in a lawsuit um, over trying to help children access school well, books. Everyone and and, and everyone when to every access library books. was shut. Yeah. yeah. So so the Internet Archive, I should say, is actually the oh, the, the foundation associated is, is funding uh, wall culture and the book that I've written. Um, and they do tremendous work. Um, I mean, they basically are doing a backup of the entire internet. They have the you know a backup for the last twenty five years. It's just extraordinary what they've done. And so one of the things they wanted to do, as you rightly say, is that when every library in the U.S. and probably every library in the world was shut down, they said, "Well, this is terrible. You know, students need to access books. People want to read books. So we will lend out eBooks. So you just download the eBooks." And these were protected ebooks so you couldn't make infinite copies and it was incredibly well done and at one point um, they were letting uh, people download uh, copies um, in a slightly more free way because several people could download a book for two weeks at the same time because so many people wanted to access a copy and again the publisher said no we don't want that and they they have sued over that because they see that broadening of access which you couldn't get anywhere else as an attack on copyright and there is a lawsuit actually still going on about this attempt to help people to read in the times of you know a pandemic which again you might think they should be praised for this but in fact they're being sued because of this and a lawsuit that's probably going to go on for some time as well as these things yeah, it's do. Yeah, it's such a waste of money um, and, and, and just unjust. You know, you do the right thing. Mm. Basically, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. So. Well, let's come back because we're going to we'll focus a bit on digital monopolies and why companies actually do take these kinds of actions, um, which and part of which is precisely to hang up um, uh people and and organizations that want to do something else, catching them up in these long running, expensive um, legal actions that mean no, nothing can go anywhere in the meantime. But we'll come back to that. I wanted to, I know an area that, that you feel really passionately about is open access as well. This area, maybe can you explain what open access is sure. and, yeah, and some, right. of the, some of the problems? Because um, I think this is an, again an area people are completely unaware of unless maybe they work in the academic yep. publishing area. Or it, it is extraordinary, um, as you rightly say. So uh, as everyone will know, you know, we have academic publishing whereby academics write papers, uh, they publish those papers, those papers are circulated and their careers depend on that. So the academic publishing is very important. What most people probably don't know is that even though an academic may spend you know, years writing that paper, they get paid nothing when that paper is published. Not only that, that paper um, is uh, checked and uh, an editor will choose it on behalf of the publishers. And those people who do the checking also don't get paid. And very often the editor who chooses that paper doesn't get paid. So you might think, well, that's okay, fair enough. It's academic world. Obviously there's no money involved. Well, there's no money involved up to that point, because then what happens is the academic publishers publish those papers and they charge a lot for, for those papers, which they've actually done very little to produce. And what's interesting is that the academic publishing world is one of the most profitable industries in the entire world. So some academic publishers uh, like Elsevier have consistently over 10 years had profit margins of 30%. 35%, 40%. And to put that in context, most companies think they're doing pretty well if they have a profit margin of 10%. So this is almost a license to print money. What makes it worse is that the people who are actually paying for that research are you and me, because the majority of academic research is paid for by the taxpayer. So we pay the academics to produce this research. The publishers publish that research and make profits and in the past, 
you and I then had to pay to read the research that we've already paid for. The open access movement said, well, that's not right. What we need to do is to make all those papers freely available. And so they've adopted a slightly different model whereby the institution of the academic pays to get it published. So that's worked quite well, except that the publishers have actually managed to subvert that and they're still making profit margins of 35% offering these so-called open access titles. So in a sense, the revolution that people have been working towards for the last 20, 30 years has failed and now we need to start again. Mm-hmm. And there's there's a, there are so many, again, um, social justice issues wrapped up in this as well because as, as you note in um, the Wald Culture book, the for a lot of acad- a lot of the people a lot of the papers that don't get published are the by the big organizations are the ones in other languages than english there's a real forced artificially um um enforced push towards um making people publish in english and if that's not your language of, of your research group or you the individual it's much harder to be published and it's also harder for people in other countries and often they're the countries that most need access to um health research for example um again covid has really highlighted so many of these things that the ability to read breaking um, research was so important to the way in which some country, especially more disadvantaged countries, um, could at least attempt to to address the pandemic. But could you talk a little bit about that? Why you know that the way in which this is also open access is a boon for um, a more more equitable access to research and to publishing, and therefore the careers of researchers not just in um, the European countries, perhaps in North America. Can you can you talk a little sure. bit about that? In fact, in fact there's, a, there's an interesting sort of two issues there. One is open access provides papers freely. So that's great for people in developing countries. It means they no longer have to pay $10,000, $20,000 a year to access a journal. But there's still a problem because, as you rightly say, if they want to publish their own research... Very often they have to do it in English, but even if they don't, they still, or their institution has to pay to publish in one of these open access titles. But there's a a new form of open access, if you like, which has a rather grand name of diamond open access, which costs nothing to publish in and nothing to read. And it's a kind of bare bones publishing. So without all the kind of glossy uh, publishing paraphernalia that one sees in the top flight magazines like Nature and Science. And it really builds on uh, a very interesting aspect of academic publishing called preprints. And this is um, basically an academic just pushes out their research in just the roughest form imaginable. And then people read that rough form. In the past, those preprints would then be edited and turned into academic uh, articles. But increasingly, people are saying, well, actually, you know what? These preprints are really good enough. Um, people have said, well, suppose they've got errors in them. But, you know, if they've got errors in them, people will tell you and you write a, a second version. So the whole the whole business of academic publishing is turning out to be not really necessary. It's very profitable, but it's not really necessary for the people who want to read these things or the people who want to write them. So I think we're seeing a second phase of that open access revolution. And I heard a really interesting talk um, just in the past week about the problems with academic publishing and um, and uh, uh, pirated images or doctored images and faulty evidence going into them because there's such a push, because publishing is so important to an academic career, there are all of these other um, uh, sort of fly-by-night journals that make a lot of money by making you pay to run your piece in it. And some people, some and including some COVID research that was got very widespread attention originally, or, um, w- appeared in some of these kinds of publications and with um, there's a, a, a number of people who try to do the detective forensics to expose the um, the the problematical images that are used in some of these things. So, so even so, academic publishing on its own even is not a guarantee that something is carefully peer reviewed and um, and 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 fact checked. 
And that, that I thought is a, um, really points out again, the value of something that's on open access and actually with all those extra eyes looking at something it, yeah, um, probably smart. is a better peer review process than perhaps I think the that's formal emerging, journal yes. process. It, 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 it's actually come from the software world where people mm. say with enough eyeballs, you know, all bugs are shallow. In other words, you have enough people looking at something, you find the errors. And I think that's very true that it doesn't need to be a glossy magazine version. The preprint will do because it's, if there's an error, someone is likely to spot it. So that it's better to spread it as widely as possible and get it out as early as possible to find the problems rather than waiting six months and then only sending it to subscribers. Yeah. Um, music is also a really problematical area of copyright control. And I think it's probably where many of us um, as individuals first come across it, either in the news, um, perhaps not so much now, but very much so for those of us that are a bit older and might remember the battles over peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and downloading files. Um, also, that crossed over, of course, into sharing films and stuff. We're still seeing battles over the leakage of uh, it, and, um, of items online and the attempts of the industry to highlight that as an issue and then perhaps bringing in um, far more um, uh, military power to encounter to, to counter it than than needs to be there and that it has affected us as individuals some sometimes in quite draconian ways given that we the individuals are quite small players in this in what is often a, a, a sort of a dark web um, big you know, big industry of, of subversion but could you go into um, how music has also comes into this copyright picture and some of the examples there that people might be aware of or might not be aware of. You're right. It's, it's a very interesting area because it's where the first big battles took place over copying because the, the music industry until the sort of 1990s basically had control over things like LPs and CDs, it was physical objects. And then when they found that people could not only make copies, but that they could make MP3s, which I'm sure most people know. But the thing about an MP3 is it's actually a, a compressed version of music. So it's quite small, very easy to share, very easy to upload and share. And so when people started doing that, as you say, with the various um, technologies like Napster and Kazaa, things like that, the recording industry lost its mind and they thought this was the end of the world. Um, and so they turn to lawsuits. I mean, thousands of lawsuits against individuals. And so they invoke the full force of the law against individuals. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, the problem is those laws were framed essentially uh, in analog times against international criminal gangs, people who are making like, you know, a million copies or something. That meant that the penalties were quite high, proportionately high. But when you start applying those penalties to individuals, then it is just insane bullying. And, one, and perhaps the most famous case is um, somebody called Jamie Thomas, who is a single mother of two. And she was caught for the, the heinous crime of downloading and sharing 24 songs. And so um, she was taken to court and lost. And she was fined $222,000. So naturally, she appealed against that because she said, well, you know, that's outrageous. And the court said, you're absolutely right. Um, let's make it 1.92 million because that's a far better sum. And so you had these insane punitive damages against individuals who had practically nothing to their name. Grandmothers were getting sued for downloading music they didn't even like because the system of actually alleging they downloaded it was so imperfect. Children at one point, uh, Cory Doctorow talks about in one of the interviews he does for War Culture that a vast proportion of the sort of American legal system was suing children over uh, allegedly downloading music. And, and I think that's a very good example of a, a moment when the analog copyright industry just went insane because they thought, we've got to stamp this out. What's interesting, sorry. What's interesting is that we don't have those conversations today because we have Spotify, we have Apple Music, we have Google Music, and the rec you know, recorded music industry is making money hand over fist. So, you know, there wasn't really a problem there. It was simply that they couldn't understand what the digital world meant or how it operated. And they were actually offered a chance to buy Napster, 
And had they done so, they would have had another 10 years of profits. But instead, they chose to shut it down because they thought sharing, piracy, kill. Whereas now, as I say, with Spotify, you know, they're making huge amounts of money. Everyone's getting access to millions of songs. You know, everyone's happy. And that's how it should be. You work with the technology. You don't try and kill it, which is what the, the first 10 or 20 years of digital copyright has been about. You think that if they had bought Napster, how much earlier we would have had the introduction of, of, of um, online music purchases? I mean, for many of us who were around at that time who can now admit that we did use Napster because the statute of limitations <laughs> has run out. I mean, what at the time, what I used Napster for was you could it was to download music that you could not find anywhere else. Or maybe it was one, like I liked music from the 60s and 70s. It might have been to find one 60s um, single that you could only find on a some huge collection in the bargain bins that you might chance across. And then often it wasn't the version of the song that was actually the yeah. one you remember. It was some other recording of it. So no, it that's, was that's a very important point. In fact, the reason that people turned to Napster, as you did, is because it was the only place to find music they loved. And it was a failure on the part of the recorded music industry to offer what people wanted that drove people to piracy. And there's lots of research that shows as soon as you offer people what they want on fair terms, they don't bother downloading stuff from uh, unauthorized sources. They're quite happy to pay for it. They just want it to be relatively easy. And yeah. that's really what Spotify has done. And Apple Music demonstrated that very quickly Absolutely. as soon as Steve Jobs was, you know, you, you needed somebody of Jobs' stature to really sit down and bang heads together and just sort of say, if you don't do this, you're, you're just going to lose out on a, on, a, on a huge market that is opening up. And this is a really interesting pattern, isn't it? It's there with books. It's there with films. It's there with music. It's these entrenched industries saying, oh, no, 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 this can't happen put that internet back into that box. We don't, you're not, you cannot do anything with things that you own and we're not going to let you buy things through this new medium. Even everyone's going, okay, well then we'll find ways to work around this and do this illegally. Whereas what most people want is just a way to, to access these items easily and conveniently and with greater choice. And as we can see now that these industries are maturing, people really want to be able to stream music. They want to be able to um, stream films. They, they wanted to be able to download them, to watch them for, and maybe, you know, there's DRM on it and they can keep it for a certain amount of time. And, and they're willing or... to pay a, pay a fair price. I mean, it's not that they don't want to pay. They just want to pay a fair price for things that they want. And, and that's how it works now. But I mean, it's people 10, pay... Exactly. They pay the equivalent of, of a movie admission, but but several, you know, every month it's guaranteed into these companies yeah. now. I mean, the amount of money we all pay on all these different streaming services is <laughs> another, <laughs> another topic entirely. Well, yeah, but right. it surely shows that the arguments that the industry uses about why we can't do something... Is, is, is just ridiculous. It's it's these. It, well, it's it just analog thinking. They just they're just so set against people having control, really, about being able to download, being able to share. They just think it's wrong reflexively. They don't think well. You know, could I actually make a lot of money? How doing could that? we so innovate they, in this area ah, and 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 how could serve we make even a, more money? Exactly, and which is what they. The film industry, for example, was able to do because suddenly everyone wanted to um, access films in this uh, in in new ways as we move through different technologies of delivery. So, um, and certainly we're seeing that with music um, with music now. Um, can you talk about maybe some of the other ways in which copyright enforcement? got very personal around this in the over the last two decades and is that still the case now or have we moved away from that i mean obviously it was we were targeting individuals with the the uh, recorded industry um industry body was taking these lawsuits against individuals probably many of us remember these happening in a, in our own countries um is that still happening or has it changed? Well, I'll just, just mention a couple of other ways in which they tried to do that because it's quite interesting to see the evolution. So you're right. That, first of all, they were suing grandmothers and children and they realized that the PR aspect of that wasn't too good. 
So they moved on a bit. And one of the ideas they came up with is quite clever called the three strikes approach, which was basically they persuaded their um, friendly politicians to pass laws uh, in certain countries saying that uh, if you were caught downloading uh, unauthorized material um, three times, typically, then you'd be thrown off the Internet. But they, they had it such that the courts did it, not the companies. So the companies could say, well, it's not nothing to do with us. It's just, you know, the courts who are actually imposing these draconian uh, penalties. And so it was a clever way to stop them being blamed for the, the suffering they were inflicting. But what's interesting is the fact that France, which was basically the leader uh, in this particular sphere of three strikes, were very strong in the idea of trying to stop this terrible piracy. Um, the system was, was actually so uh, impossible to implement that in the end, only one person was actually uh, formally disconnected from the internet, from all the millions of people who shared files. And even um, that particular disconnection was never implemented because they were only allowed to, to disconnect the web part of the internet connection. They had to leave the email part, which you know is impossible. So th the industry has a habit of not understanding how the internet works. And the three strikes is a very good example of that. Um, so they, they've adopted another approach, which um, is still very much around, which is to try and use international treaties to impose laws which they couldn't get through directly. And there was a very famous um, moment in uh, internet and digital copyright history um, around the Stop Online Piracy Act, SOPA, which was going to be brought in in the US. Uh, it was 2011 that it was first uh, mooted. And people realized that this was actually an industry attack on the internet. Um, and they mobilized in a way that had never been done before. And that culminated in a famous internet blackout where things like Wikipedia blacked out their, their pages. Uh, and many other sites, 100,000, I think, joined in. People actually took to the streets. It got to the point that um, they were ringing the US politicians to such an extent that to this day, politicians say, you know, don't ever let that happen again. I don't want to drive these, you know, internet crazes to, to this point. So this was important because it showed that copyright was no longer this obscure legal aspect to do with, you know, books and things like that. It was about people's lives, and particularly young people, obviously. And they took to the streets in huge numbers. And then as a follow up to that in Europe, we had the anti counterfeit um, trade agreements, which was trying to stop counterfeiting um, using similar draconian methods. And there were huge demonstrations, particularly in Germany and in Poland, uh, and that was thrown out as indeed SOPA was. So those were two very important moments when, you know, people, young people rose up and said, uh, copyright is not sacred. You know, the internet is so important to our lives. You can't do this. So that there are still those kind of attempts, I think, going on. And and it's, I think, you know, we have to point out that we've got interviews with some of the people who were there, right, as that was, um, as that happened, we have two, Evan Greer and um, Leah um, Holland from Fight for the Future, which was the organization that really organized that SOPA protest and was, was, was critical in that suggestion that... Uh, that there be protest, helping to organize protests and then coming up with this notion of the internet blackout, which was so powerful. And eventually a lot of the big mainstream companies rode in behind it, which hadn't looked like it was going to happen. We have Mike Masnick from Tech Dirt, who also was instrumental in, at that um, point and, um, and who talks about how he really doubted that, that um, and he was quite worried on whether that would take off in that way. It might just fizzle out, and then and then the industry could use against the, uh, all the rest of us this idea that no one was interested in these topics, and instead it went the other way. And um, and that was in the in the animal made. world, it was true. I mean, you know, people didn't care about copyright because it didn't matter. I mean. The fact that there was copyright in, you know, your photograph or your letter was irrelevant. But as soon as it becomes digital, it's it's all the things you share on Facebook or Instagram. It's it's everything you do in your daily lives a hundred times, a thousand times a day. It's copyright every single time. So they realized it mattered. Well, let's talk about then what what begins to happen building on that. That some of the ways, some of the 
um, methods of copyright control that we're seeing now, people will be familiar with takedown requests, with blocking website blocking, with um, with some of these things that um, we might have encountered even when we're trying to do we post something or um, maybe we you know we run a site a discussion board or something and we've we've been the the target of these kinds of requests yeah. um talk a bit about those and, and, and take what's, down, what's happening with takedown requests in particular are very important so i'm glad you raised that because it's become a very popular way for the industry to try and uh, get rid of things online that they don't like and in general, companies like Google and Facebook are happy to do that because in doing so, it absolves them of the responsibility of having unauthorized material, which otherwise they get sued for with these rather large sums of money. So Google typically gets billions of takedown requests. But there's one particular aspect I think is worth pointing out because it's indicative of the way copyright works, which is that if you want to send a takedown request, you basically have to make a, a good faith claim that you think someone's uh, placed some of your copyright material online. However, the person receiving that takedown request has to basically swear on oath of perjury that it's not unauthorized. So you've got this asymmetry that the industry can say, well, that looked vaguely like mine. I think it's mine. And that's good enough. But if you want to contest that, you have to swear... Uh, on pain of perjury, that you're telling the truth. So naturally, very few people are willing to risk getting you know, arrested for perjury. So this shows how the laws tend to be framed in an asymmetric fashion that gives the power to the companies and it assumes that the little people, you and I, will just do as we're told. And, and that's um, been a general pattern over the last 20 or 30 years because the copyright industry is used to having everything its own way, not just in terms of the law, but also in terms of getting new laws coming through. It basically speaks to its friendly lawyers saying, we need a new law because there's this terrible problem. And they, by and large, they've always got it. Uh, SOPA is one of the few instances when they didn't. So uh, I think this is part of a, a systemic problem in copyright that our views as ordinary people are not really counted as being of interest. And I think a really important part of that too that you discuss in the book is that the that the mere threat of the 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 of the requ the letter request is enough to just make people of course because act right away these because are framed you're... by corporate lawyers mm. who write frightening letters they send to somebody who gets them at breakfast has never seen a letter like this before doesn't have a lawyer isn't going to have a lawyer. You get someone threatening you with, you know, prison and God knows what else. You know, you throw your hands up and say, I surrender. So again, you've got this asymmetry, which uh, is is absolutely key to a lot of the interactions in the copyright world. And this is and, and this really affects small creators too. people who might have utilized a, a something quite small in a, um, a snippet, a, a, a bit of a video, a bit, a piece of music, you know, or a, a photo that they in in a repurposed work, so it might fall within fair use doctrine Absolutely. and be it's, it's completely allowable. But how that requires all of us to be familiar with the legal grounding of exactly. in, in the country in which we're sitting, or whether we can yeah. be affected by the the law in another country because everything is online. I mean, it's it's a, it is a huge burden on the individual. Well, it's impossible. I mean, you, you even lawyers and judges struggle to delineate the the point at which something that you're building on becomes an infringement. And so no, you know, ordinary user is going to take that risk of losing their house or whatever, because, you know, the costs mm. involved are huge and the fines are huge. So you really are talking about betting your entire, uh, you know, possessions mm. On, mm. on some copyright issue. You're not going to do it. And maybe and something exactly quite minor. Yeah, that's what oh, they're yeah. betting on, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, well, let's, let's, ta let's talk about some of the legislation then that, that has come in um, and some of the problems with it. You, you began... At the start of the podcast, mentioned the European Union Copyright Directive. Maybe that's a good thing to to, well, to it, focus on and yeah. some of the problems with that. It, in a way, uh, I didn't really know this when I was writing the book, but as I wrote it, it became clear that it was all leading up to that, really, because the um, European Union Copyright Directive is in many ways the latest attempt by the copyright industry to 
uh, assert control over what we do online. And given all these things that I've talked about before have failed in various ways, I mean, the laws were passed, but they're just really bad laws. Um, this is the latest attempt. So it began back in 2012 when um, the European Commission said, well, you know, the digital stuff's getting quite important. We need some new, your, new laws to address it. And that's absolutely right. The, the copyright laws were not keeping up with the technology. And so this was a great opportunity to actually bring copyright into the digital age. Unfortunately, they didn't do that. Um, so one example of what they didn't do, I'll talk a minute what they did do, but one example of what they didn't do is something called freedom of panorama. And this again is probably something that most people have never heard of. And when they do hear of it, I think is absurd. And it's the fact that in many countries, you are not allowed to take pictures of uh, buildings that are in the public, that there is a, essentially a copyright on the appearance of that building. And there's a very good example of when this applies, which is in Paris, which again, not many people know, but when you go to Paris, you take pictures of the Eiffel Tower, that's fine. But if you were to take a picture of the Eiffel Tower at night, you would actually be breaking the law because there is copyright in the lights on the Eiffel Tower and you are not allowed to take a picture of those lights without obtaining permission from the copyright holders. That, I'm um, sure that's new for a lot of... I didn't know that. Yeah, so, so that's, you know, a few hundred until, million people who have broken the law. I mean, yeah, I, that's, I, that's, that's, I'm, I confess I've broken the law, so uh-oh. <laughs> no, it's extraordinary. I mean, this shows how divorced copyright has become from reality. And the, the reason it's a problem is because everyone now has a fantastic phone in their smartphone, a fantastic camera in their smartphone. And so it takes pictures of everything, which tends to include buildings and it tends to include the Eiffel Tower at night if you happen to be near the Eiffel Tower. So the, the way we live in this digital world is just incompatible with the copyright law as framed. So that's something that they could have done. It was something that uh, I can't remember, but, but there's 100,000 or a million people signed a petition asking for them to do. But they didn't do it. I mean, such a tiny thing. What they did do was they gave new powers to the copyright companies. And um, perhaps the most important, because it's going to be a real problem, is to do with people who upload material to sites like um, YouTube, Facebook, the big sites that have billions of pieces of uh, copyright material. Um, the copyright companies really don't like that. And so what they managed to persuade the European Union to do is pass a law that says you must get a license, the company must get a license for everything that is uploaded. Now, there's a slight problem with that because you might think, well, OK, I can probably get a license for music or maybe films. But copyright applies to much more than that. It applies to pictures. It applies to maps. It applies to ballet scores, it applies to music scores, it applies to 3D models. And there is no way that companies can get a license for those because there's no one that can give it. So there is an alternative which the law foresees, which is that if they can't get a license, they must block it. So anything for which they don't have a license, they must block, stop you uploading. So how are you going to do that? Well, if you think about YouTube, um, I just, I'm trying to remember what the statistic is. Oh, yeah. In 2020, 500 hours of videos are uploaded every minute. Right. So that means that it's impossible for a human being to review them, to check whether there's copyright infringement. The only way you can do it is with a computer. You actually have an algorithm that checks it. But those algorithms are unable to encapsulate copyright law, which is hideously complicated. So the problem you mentioned before about creators finding their works blocked is going to get far worse because this new copyright directive says you must implement these upload filters to block anything that is an infringement. But they are also bound to exceed that sort of mandate and block things that are legal because there's no way that they won't. So we are entering a world where, in Europe at least, everything that's uploaded to the big sites is going to be checked by a rather stupid program. And so we're, we're basically entering surveillance by uh, algorithms 
uh, on those sites, which is a terrible state to get into. I mean, this is not how the internet was supposed to work, but everything that you upload will be checked against a, you know, a list of some kind, or if not a list, it will guess whether you might be breaking the law. So it's, it's, it's going to be bad. This is only just coming in now. That's why most people won't know about it, and we haven't seen the effects of it, but I predict it's going to be really bad. It's, it's a... Um it really is an example of what happens when the industry gets in and lobbies hard as well. I mean, this would have, the, that copyright directive would have been one of the most lobbied pieces of legislation um, in the EU alongside other things that are um, specifically digitally targeted as uh, privacy directives, the GDPR, the, the, the incoming um, Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act. It, it clearly, it, if it's online now, we're seeing that these are areas in which big monopolies lobby very heavily to get the legislation that they want. And I think um, that's a good transition to talk a little bit about how copyright um, produces these monopolies or how the monopolies utilize copyright to retain control and maybe some of the uh, you've touched on some of the absurdities that are produced by that situation um, you might you might give us a few of those before we um, before we conclude a bit on 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 how do we deal with all of this but yeah t t talk to us about some of the monopolism so, uh here because copyright is so strong, it, it means that people are always very cautious about doing things that they really want to do. So a good example of that is uh, the preservation of films. Um, there are a lot of films that are kept in uh, sort of film libraries and they're rotting basically because of the particular chemical processes used to make them. But because they're covered by copyright, you can't make a backup copy of that film because it would be an infringement of copyright. And very often you can't find who actually owns it. This is actually a general problem known as orphan works where there are millions of books and millions of uh, images, films, whatever, where we don't know who owns the copyright. So we can't ask anyone to give us permission to actually make a backup. And without that backup, these films, for example, are just going to rot. Um, another good example, it, a slightly more modern one, is to do with video games, um, which many people obviously have played and know that you know they, be, they go out of fashion and then you move on to the next one. But what about all the old ones? I mean, that's a, a form of digital culture, so we really need to preserve them. But if you think about it, there are two problems. One is that very often they are stored on media that uh, degenerate. I mean, like if you've got a floppy disk, a floppy disk, if anyone remembers those, um, starts to you know uh, lose its capacity to hold information after a few years. Uh, CD-ROMs, DVDs, all, de all degrade over time. So what you want to do is make a backup of that. But again, you can't do that without the copyright holder's permission. And if you can't find the copyright holder or they won't give it, then these things uh, can't be backed up. There's another problem, which again, I'm sure anyone who's played games knows, is that you can only play games usually on a certain hardware platform because they're written for uh, Nintendo or whatever it may be. And as time goes on, a lot of these companies go bankrupt and therefore there are no machines left that you could play these games on. Now, it's possible to produce what are called emulators, which are basically pretend versions of those systems. But again, that's breaking the law. You can't do that without the permission of the people that actually own the copyright. So you've got this paradoxical situation whereby copyright actually causes the loss of culture. It prevents you preserving things that are worth preserving. Um, so, you know, this shows the extent to which copyright has been turned on its head. It's no longer promoting culture. Uh, it's, it's actually harming it. And some of the, the, the actions of some of these companies, clearly these major lawsuits have... Um have produced knock-on effects that some of our guests that we've talked to in this in the course of um, our podcasts have really emphasized how often it's the collateral damage, it's the it's the um, so-called unintended consequences that really are the intended consequences and the point of these lawsuits. Uh, they make so much. Um, 
so much that we might want to do online, so much more difficult and that there are even things that actually we do have rights to do, but the, but the, the, the way of trying to do those things or accessing them, as you say, we, we, you can't get the permission to utilize the format to access something that already exists. Even if it, the creator gives permission, it's maybe somebody else owns copyright that is an impediment due to these crazy laws. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that before we move to how we might address to some of these things? Because I think people tend, so often copyright is presented as something that is protecting the smaller creator. Yeah. When yeah. Uh, And then these lawsuits are supposed to be defending large principles that defend, say, the individual musician or photographer or writer or, or um, software developer. We didn't even touch on the, that whole area as well, which is so impacted by copyright researchers, we, we've we noted. Um, but these these what actually happens is a chilling effect in a much broader way. Can you talk a bit about sure. that? In, in fact, it, it, you're, you're raising a very important issue, which is the mythology of copyright, which is that it is about protecting the creator, about the little person that's producing something fantastic. And that's just simply not true. Uh, we've got to the stage now where it is the intermediaries. So it is the academic publishers that take all the work by the academics. It mm. is the large uh, recorded music companies that basically force the musicians to sign contracts, which mean that they end up with all the benefit. I mean, recently, um, uh, a company floated on the stock exchange of recorded music company uh, for 40 billion euros. Um, and none of that was really going to go to the musicians. That went to the company and the shareholders. Um, in, and, the, and indeed, a UK parliamentary report um, emphasised that the musicians are not actually getting much money from Spotify. Uh, even though Spotify is generating lots of money, that money goes to the recorded music companies. Mm -hmm. So... In fact, this idea that copyright is good for the actual creator simply isn't borne out by the evidence. Companies are doing really well from it. And that's why, as you rightly say, they are so keen to retain their control. They're so keen to bring in new laws that strengthen their powers, not for the benefit of the creators, but for their own bottom line, essentially. Can you t then just maybe let, let's conclude on this note of how do we get out of this mess? <laughs> okay, so I think the, um, the key really is looking at what, what you know, we're trying to do here. So what we want is to support creators. Clearly, that's fundamental. And we want them to produce good stuff, which we then have access to. And if you think about the, the key dynamic there, it's nothing to do with these conglomerates, the corporates, the big companies. It's about the relationship of the creator with their fans. So mm -hmm. people who love the work of a writer or a musician or whatever artistic form you're talking about, they want their uh, particular creator to produce more of what they love. So it's in their interest to support them as fully as they can. And um, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, someone called Kevin Kelly came up with an idea which builds on that. And he said that what creators really need uh, are 1,000 true fans. So if you can find 1,000 people that love your work to distraction those thousand people will support you as much as is necessary to keep you producing. And they won't care whether other people are getting it for free. They won't care about so-called piracy. All they care about is getting what they love from the artists that they love. So if you can build a system that allows people to support the, the artists that they care about, then a lot of the problems go away. And in fact, we can do that now because you've got all these things uh, in terms of you know, GoFundMe and all the other mm -hmm. kind of pa patron, Patreon uh, mm -hmm. systems that allow people to give money directly to the artists. And the current system is that an artist gets probably, I don't know, 5% of the money that actually goes towards their art. So the other 95% goes to the intermediaries. If we can turn that around such that the artists get 95%, then obviously you only need one twentieth of the number of people to support them. So I think that this true fans idea, whereby people connect very directly 
with the artists. And the artists in turn connect directly with their fans, which again is something that many of them say that they miss, you know, that they don't mm. have the opportunity to connect with the people that love their work. It's actually a very positive dynamic that could replace the traditional copyright commercial version that we currently have. Great. Um, well, I think that's a, a really good point to to conclude and to also point out that um, we have so many resources available to you, the listener or viewer out there, to learn more about these topics. You can read um, uh, the Wald Culture book, which you can download for free from the waldculture.org website. It's also full of blog posts um, that over um, sometimes numerous posts per week by Glenn exploring so many of these issues, sometimes by guest contributors as well. Um, some of them will be, as I said, very topical into the moment. Some are touch on some of these historical issues that we've been talking about as well. And of course, you have the resource of all the podcasts that we've been doing so far um, with dozens of the some of the leading uh, figures in this copyright struggle on the artistic side, the legal side, the academic side, really giving such interesting perspective and insight into these subjects from their own areas of expertise. So um, be sure to check out waldculture.org for all of those resources. And for me for now, I just want to say thanks, Glenn, for joining us and giving us such a nice, concise um summary of so many broad issues because that's not an easy task to do and again he's doing does that very well in the wild culture book as well which you can download for free and um thank you viewers and listeners for joining us and it's goodbye from me for now carla the linkton and the wild culture podcast and we hope that you'll be back again soon and have an, uh, enjoy exploring some of our archive materials that are all there for you to spend afternoons, weeks and weekends um, learning more about copyright from. Thanks so much and goodbye. Bye.